So thankful, John and Angela, so thankful that you're here and honored that you shared that with us tonight. And I am thankful that you're here as well. My name's Chris. I have the privilege to serve as one of the pastors here at the church. And uh, I don't know about you, but uh, as we sang Away in a Manger, I mean, we got a little bit of like the psychedelic um, computer crashing image up there on the screen. Uh, That's probably the first time that that's ever uh, happened here. Uh, So nonetheless, we are here tonight. Um, God, not out, of, not out of our perfection, but out of God's perfection. We come here thinking of and reflecting upon Emmanuel, God with us. That God himself came in the person of Jesus and forever changed the world. During Advent, the four Sundays leading to Christmas Day, we have had a theme in our series called Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. And we looked at Mary and her faithfulness. We looked at Joseph and his listening and obeying. We looked at Anna and Simeon and their waiting and anticipating, which, as I mentioned earlier in this series, Christmas Eve night was the hardest as a kid and as a teenager. And for many of us adults, we're just eager, right? We're like, let's get to Christmas. Let's celebrate Christmas. And today, this morning, we talked about Herod and the Magi. And we talked about how they sought Jesus and responded to Jesus and then ultimately were changed by Jesus. The Magi were. Herod's life took a radically different direction because he did not seek, he did not respond, and he was not changed. But what about us tonight? What about my eyes and what about your eyes? Where are they at tonight? Christmas can be extremely difficult to keep our eyes on Jesus. And you think of all that you've done to get to this point tonight, and maybe some of you are thinking about what you still have to do tonight and tomorrow morning and tomorrow. And it's hard to keep our eyes on Jesus. I mean, even with the service is, is making sure everything is in place and we have enough seats and volunteers and technology does its thing and all these different things. It's hard even here to keep our eyes on Jesus. But we desire to do that. We desire to have our eyes on Jesus. It's so easy to miss the dwelling of God, Jesus, who was offered as a gift. When I was a teenager, teenager back in the 1900s, that, that sounds kind of fun to say. That makes me sound way older than I actually am. But in the 90s, we would go to these places called malls. Many of you remember what those are. And they had kiosks, and I know malls still have kiosks here today. But there was one kiosk in the 90s that drove me crazy, and maybe you can relate. There was one kiosk that we would walk by, my friends would always stop, and we would look at what was at this kiosk, and it drove me crazy, because I could not see what they saw, and they knew it, and they made fun of me, and they just had the best time. And maybe you remember these. Let's let's put one of them up. Anyone remember these magic eye posters? They're horrible. Some of you right now are like, I see it. I know what's there, and I still cannot see it. Can anyone see what it is? Just out of curiosity. Are you serious, Johnny? Johnny sees a snowman. Anyone else see a snowman? Oh, man. Uh, Yep, so go to the next slide here. Uh, Yep, see, there's a snowman there. It's people like Johnny that drove me crazy. Now go back. One, or go forward. That's the same first image. Do you see the snowman even though you know it's there? I don't see it either. (laughs) And I've stared at this image again and again and again. Maybe we'll share this later and you can just like try to figure this out and hang out with Johnny. But people would do all sorts of things to try to see this, like turn their head or squint or get close or get far away to try to see this image that was there but was not obvious. And as my eyes were locked on that, I still could not see it. My desire was there. My heart was there. It was there, but I just couldn't fully see it. And so I had to trust. I had to believe that it was there. So often we just wait for sight. So often we just wait to be able to see things clearly and then we'll believe. But then is that really belief? There's a difference with belief in just simply seeing. Tonight we come and we not only think of the Christ child, but we think of Christ who lived a full life, who ministered who gave his life away sacrificially on a cross, who died, who was buried, who was resurrected, and ultimately is exalted as King of kings and Lord of lords. And so we see through what we celebrate tonight, and we see through the cross, and we see through this hope given because of Jesus. 
And Paul, in Colossians, he tries to describe Jesus. It's kind of like this magic eye thing, is that he tries to describe him the best he could. He says this, the Son, being Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. Like, God is present, God is real. And the closest we can come to seeing him is in the person of Jesus until we stand before him in eternity, and we're just like, whoa. He says he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. So everything we see, all the powers, all the authorities that's ever been, that ever will be, is created by and for Jesus. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. We can see the work of Jesus. We have the recordings of the work of Jesus, the cross, what Jesus did. He's the image of the invisible God. Like that second image of that snowman there is like, I see God because of Jesus. Tonight, Brooke and Drew shared a spoken word, and they talked about creation. This is what Paul pointed out. Firstborn of our creation. Talked about the fall that Jesus was to reconcile all things to himself through himself. The redemption, he made peace through his blood on the cross and restoration that he is the head of the church and he holds all things together. Why? Well, to be reconciled to God. For we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God, scripture tells us. Scripture tells us that there's no one righteous, not even one. That there's a separation between God and sinful humanity. Me. You. And it's Jesus that bridges that gap. In Hebrews, it says this, Christ was sacrificed once to take away all the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Someone described it this way, is that Jesus, he takes the hand of the repentant, yielding sinner, and he takes the outstretched hand of a holy yet loving God, and he joins the two. He can forgive our sins, reconcile us to God, and make peace through his blood on the cross. God is eager to do this. He's eager to do this. A verse that we often hear at this time of year, or sometimes we hear at this time of year, is is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That's why we celebrate Christmas. He loved you. Yes, you. Love me. Love that person sitting next to you, the people outside of these walls. He so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He gave Jesus to us that we celebrate in the season. That whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. So often we think of God that way. as He's just this vengeful, wrath-filled God that he's out to get you. Rather, Jesus is this gift of love and this gift of life. It says, whoever believes in him is not condemned but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. I want to remind you or tell you for the first time or for you to hear this for the thousandth time that Jesus is a gift of love, that this season is a gift of love to us, that Jesus is salvation. Susan encouraged us to receive this gift of love, this gift of light, Jesus. And John, it continues, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but in verse 19 it says, this is the verdict, that light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light. That light has come into the world. If we skip down to verse 21, it says, whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, that it may be seen plainly what we have done in the sight of God. So we step into the light. That there's not this fear, there's not this like hiding That we can be real and honest before God because he is a loving God who gave his one and only son for you and for me. I want to encourage you today, maybe for the first time or as a 
as a step that you've taken before is to turn your eyes upon Jesus. To look into his loving face. To be reminded of his compassion and his kindness for you. Of his mercy and his grace that is yours to take to receive this gift, salvation. To believe in him, the one who came to forgive you of all your sins. Yes, even that one that you have a hard time forgiving yourself for, or that thing that you hope no one finds out about, Jesus came and he's willing to forgive you of that. Receive that forgiveness and erase what separates you from God. Jesus is that gift. That's what the season is about. Allow him to be that light. I want to invite you to pray with me. Merciful Father, gracious God, we thank you for the gift of Jesus. We thank you for the gift of love, the gift for light, the gift of salvation. And Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except by him. And so, Lord, here tonight, God, may this be a time for many individuals to say yes to you for the first time, to confess their sin, and even in this moment, in this place, to confess whatever that is that separates them from you those words, those actions, those choices. And for each one of us to receive the forgiveness, that confession that I am a sinner, that sin defines me, but no longer I am washed white as snow, that I am renewed because of what Jesus did. And that here tonight, I want to walk with you the light of the world, to embrace your love, to embrace your light. Jesus, we are grateful that you broke through darkness so long ago, that you are hope, or that you are love, that you are light. And so Jesus, this evening and the day to come, God, may we continue to reflect and remember you. We pray this in Jesus' strong, powerful, and wonderful name. Amen. I want to invite the choir to come and join me, and also Pastor Gerton uh, to come and join me. As I was uh, hearing Susan's story earlier and just reading this verse, I can't help but to, to look at the tree that's over there and these lights, and we're surrounded by lights and light breaking through. And really, light is a, a symbol of change. It is this, this hope, and, and that tree is a tree pointing us to the change in Jesus. And this year, each of those lights represent an individual who said yes for the first time or who renewed their walk with you, with Jesus. And maybe this coming Sunday or a Sunday ahead that you want to profess publicly that I'm following Jesus. And so I just ask that you consider that as you walk and you start with him. And Pastor, I want to invite you to come forward. Every year we end this service, and uh, I just have so many sweet memories for so many years, of pausing and singing Silent Night. And what we're going to do is we're going to sing Silent Night. And I laugh as I look back, Pastor. Pastor is the founding pastor of this church. And I remember so many Christmas Eves, you properly teaching us how to pass the light, right? And you know this, right? Is that Jesus ultimately is this hope of the world. And I remember you so often saying that as you hold that light, you hold it upright. You point it forward. And as it's passed, you pass that way and come from the side. There's a practical but yet spiritual reality that takes place here. And so I'm going to invite uh, those in the tech to lower the lights. I want to invite everyone here to stand. And as these lights are all lowered, that you would watch this light pass, that you would proclaim Jesus, that we would sing out Silent Night, that Jesus would be this light that we carry as followers of him, that we would carry this into the dark places that we so often walk in that we would point Jesus, point people to Jesus. And may we proclaim this this Christmas. Let's sing. Mm-hmm.